good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Paul Fonsale. I'm one of the co-founders of The Conduit. Um, and I want to welcome you to the Conduit Systemic Solution Stage. And the first in a series of fast-paced sessions showcasing a suite of interventions across business, policy, tech, and finance that are shifting the world towards positive tipping points in tackling climate change. So a few points of context about what these solution stages are intended to achieve. When we started talking to Stephen and the New York Times team about hosting this conference at The Conduit, we wanted a partner like the New York Times, which has the best content, content extraordinary journalism, bringing cutting edge analysis and remarkable debates of the type that you've just heard, to be able to present that to all of you to sharpen our thinking about the existential challenges of climate change. And then, as the conduit, we wanted to be able to take that analysis and move it towards tangible action, towards solutions, so that we don't curl ourselves up into a fetal ball and a depressed state about the magnitude of the challenges. We actually set out sets of things that can meaningfully accelerate our path towards net zero. And in so doing, there was no better organization to partner with than Systemic. Um, Systemic is the world's premier system change organization, which is working with governments, with corporations, which, and with other influential actors to try and accelerate the path towards net zero. So we've conceived of the six sessions that you will hear during the course of these three-day conference in deep partnership with Systemic. Um, and what we sought to do is present a set of leaders, um, entrepreneurs, and in some cases activists who are working towards these sorts of solutions. So in the first of our solution stage, uh, we'll be hearing about incredible innovations harnessing the potential of the ocean to drive carbon capture and sequestration. And as we know, without carbon capture and sequestration, our path to net zero becomes well nigh impossible. The maths and the physics make it very difficult. So we think this is a really interesting and indeed indispensable part of the conversation. A very big thank you to the Crown Estate and to Salesforce in allowing, to br uh, allowing us to bring these sessions to you and to all of those who are watching online. Um, and so before I hand over to Katrina Ridley, please be aware that at 1.15 today in the reading room, which is one floor up, we'll be hosting our first solution circle with the Crown Estate. So here we discuss uh, what the solutions are, and then we take it one step further, we convene a really remarkable group of people, one floor up, to actually talk about how we put the ideas into practice. I've just gone through the resumes of the people who are already signed up to attend. It is a really fascinating and remarkable group of people. There are still some spaces available, so if you want to, please do join at 1.15 um, above, in just exactly one floor above. And then just to let you know that the rest of the solution stage is coming up. At 3.30 today, there is a session on harnessing the power of the forest and scaling agroforestry. Tomorrow, there's a session on proteins of the future. And tomorrow afternoon, um, Africa, climate vanguard, not climate victim. As an African, I'm particularly biased towards that session, and it's awesome, I can tell you. Not that the others aren't, that's just that one's good. Um, and then finally, uh, we have a session on curbing plastic emissions, um, and then a final session with Jeremy Oppenheim and Rian Mari Thomas and myself, which tries to wrap up both the conclusions of the conference and set out a path and a set of solutions that we think are fundable and implementable within um, the time scales necessary for us to uh, safeguard um, this dear planet of ours. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Katrina. Hello, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Katrina Ridley. I'm a broadcaster, uh, mainly on Heart Radio, which involves a lot of rubbish chat about Ed Sheeran. But um, what I really enjoy is I host uh, the Rethinkers podcast, which is a sustainability podcast. Um, but yeah, I'm going to be your host for the next 45 minutes or so. So a big welcome, a big round of applause as well to Paul, just to start. 
Um, and this is the first in the series of the Solution Stage Sessions, which is really exciting. Um, it is presented to you as a collaboration between The Conduit and Systemic. Um, hands up, who's a member of The Conduit? Anyone? Woo, snap, me too. Um, so in case you don't know, The Conduit is a collaborative community of change makers working to create a more just, prosperous and sustainable world. Um, yeah, we've got fantastic cocktails, cakes and really nice people. So if you need any help, just grab one of those people and they'll be very friendly. Um, and Systemic as well, in case you don't know, is a system change company that aims to bring speed and scale to transforming five systems that shape the way we live and work. Uh, energy, nature, materials, cities, and finance. Um, and Systemic also operates globa globally. So, um, yes, very cool organization. Um, the logistics of today, I make this sound very boring, but it's very exciting. Has anyone heard of Pecha Kucha before? Put your hand up. Very impressed. I didn't know what it was until last week. Um, but it's basically a storytelling format, um, and it means the sound of conversation in Japanese. Um, so each presenter will have 20 seconds to talk us through 20 slides. As you can appreciate, this might be a bit challenging. It's kind of like Britain's Got Talent. I know, 20 seconds. Um, yeah, it's kind of like Britain's Got Talent with the time limit but no buzzers, so just three stars to everyone. Um, but yeah, so if you've got any questions during these talks, please do bank them for the end. Um, welcome as well, if you're watching virtually, feel free to put your questions in the chat. Um, yeah, we will come back to all of those at the end. Um, but yeah, today we're gonna be shining a light on loads of different innovations that are happening across business, policy, tech, and finance, just to reinstate what Paul said. Um, that are shifting the world towards positive tipping points in the fight against climate change. And yeah, a key part of the solution stage isn't just the talk. We are about the solutions, taking clear, tangible actions um, by people who are doing amazing things, a lot of them in this room, and some will be joining us virtually. Um, but yeah, we'll be going offshore with some great innovators. They're harnessing the potential of the ocean to drive carbon capture and sequestration. And just to clarify, we are using the word solutions here, but do take that with a pinch of salt. We know there's no such thing as a silver bullet in the fight against climate change. Um, but yeah, so think of them as like a curation of um, interventions that we think are amazing and that we really need to harness to fight this change. Um, so yeah, let's get a proper expert uh, in the field to tell us why this is also important. This afternoon, we are joined um, by the director of the Energy Transition Commission. They are a global coalition of leaders from across the energy landscape, working together to accelerate the transition to a net zero emissions future. I'll let her tell you more about it. That was a big introduction. Ita! <laughs> great to be with you today um, and to talk about this incredibly important topic of ocean-based carbon removals. And I'm just going to kick off the discussion before we hear about those solutions that we've just heard to give you a bit of context around where do ocean carbon uh, removals fit in the debate. So as we are all, oh sorry, as we are all aware, climate change is with us. The IPCC tells us we have a limited and declining budget of greenhouse gas emissions that we can emit. To have a 50% chance of keeping global warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius and a 90% chance of keeping it below two, these are all probability distributions here, we can only emit 500 gigatons of carbon dioxide between 2020 and 2050. That's equivalent to just over 10 years of emissions at current rates. And so of this 500 gigatons, only around 420 gigatons remains today in 2022. And we must not exceed this carbon budget. And indeed, the climate, all the indications from the climate science are that we should really aim to undershoot it. So where do oceans fit into this carbon budget story? The oceans are one of the world's largest carbon sinks, um, absorbing CO2 from the atmosphere and storing it deep within the oceans. And climate change itself is one of the fastest growing threats to the oceans. Rising temperatures, ocean acidification, sea level rise, hypoxia, they're all having a devastating impact on marine biodiversity today. 
But oceans can also play a significant role in addressing the causes of climate change. They can help us to reduce emissions. Today already, oceans absorb 25% of anthropological CO2 emissions, the emissions that we're producing with our, the way that we drive our economy today. They also are going to host technologies such as offshore wind that will enable us to move away from fossil fuels. And there's a suite of other mitigation opportunities that oceans can drive. But increasingly, people are really recognizing that oceans have a tremendous role for carbon dioxide removals, too. They, we can accelerate and strengthen the ocean's natural carbon pump cycles. And indeed, some estimates are that oceans could provide gigascale level removals in the next decade. So this brings us to the role of carbon dioxide removals. Where do they fit in the story? We know we have a limited and declining carbon budget. But the first thing we must focus on is cutting our gross emissions. All sectors of the economy must decarbonize uh, in uh, the next three decades. The question is how fast we can do this. If we're on an ambitious de decarbonization pathway, the green line on the chart on the right will release 725 gigatons of carbon between now and 2050, compared to that 500. If we're on an even more ambitious pathway, the blue line, the one below it, um, we, can, we will emit 570, but to be clear on what does that ambition look like, that means by 2030, closing half of the world's existing coal-fired fleet, halting deforestation completely, a critical priority, but one we've, we've struggled to, to deliver, and making 40% cuts to methane emissions from fossil fuel, from agriculture, for waste. It is achievable, and in fact, we should be aiming for it, but it's a very ambitious pathway. Carbon dioxide removals will be required to address this gap. To avoid overshooting that 500, we need to also be removing carbon from the atmosphere. It's an addition, not instead of, the rapid and deep decarbonization that we must be delivering. So, removals are a critical part of the portfolio of solutions for in our fight to keep global warming below 1.5. What are the different solutions we can draw on? So, first, it's worth noticing, no, uh, noting that no single carbon dioxide solution can be deployed fast enough to give us all the removals that we probably need in the next 30 years. All CDR solutions have trade-offs between cost, risks, benefits, and ultimately a portfolio of solutions will be needed. But there's three main types, natural climate solutions, hybrid solutions, and engineered solutions. And to brief, and all of these solutions have marine variants. So to bring them to life, ocean-based natural climate solutions, where, where what we're doing here is we're harnessing photosynthesis to trap the carbon from the air, and then we're storing it in the biosphere. Blue carbon projects, so restoring salt marshes, mangrove forests, seagrass meadows, these all have major benefits to biodiversity and remove carbon. You can also have seaweed cultivation, where the lost harvest will be buried in, deep, in sediments deep at the bottom of the sea. You have hybrid ocean solutions, which combine this photosynthesis, this natural process of capturing carbon, with engineered interventions. So ocean becks, you can have heard of. So that would be seaweed harvesting and then using that energy combined with CCS to sequester carbon. Artificial upwelling, pumping water up from the deep sea so you have nutrient-rich water near the top. With the sunlight, you can have more photosynthesis. Ocean fertilization adding fertilizer, again, enhancing photosynthesis. And you finally have engineered solutions as well. These would be things like alkalinity enhancement, which allow, us, uh, allow the sea to sequester uh, more carbon from the atmosphere, or electrochemical uh, ocean capture, which is kind of DAX. It's, it's directly capturing carbon uh, from seawater. There are many, many ideas, and there's lots of potential. It's worth noting that these solutions are in very different stages of technical readiness, and this is a very a relatively new area. And what's really critical is that we take a science-based and precautionary approach to CDR. The challenge that we're trying to meet has a very, very uh, quick time dimension that we're trying to meet, but we still must fully assess the system impacts of these solutions and really beware unintended consequences when we are introducing novel approaches into the ocean context. So with that note and caution, 
There is a need, and oceans themselves are going to be a critical part of the portfolio of solutions. And with that, I'll hand over to the people that will talk to you a little bit in a little bit more detail about some of the solutions that are being developed today. Thank you very much to Ita there. Um, now over to our first of three speakers today. Um, remember, it's Petra Kucha, so um, rather you than me. Um, but yeah, so a big round of applause, please, to the head of New Marine Ventures at the Crown Estate, Nicola Clay. Thank you very much, Katrina. Um, hello, everybody. I hope you'll be kinder than Simon Cowell. <laughs> as, I, as I attempt with the, uh, the Petra Kucha. So, um, yeah, great to be here uh, this afternoon. Great for the Crown Strait to be contributing to this important event, um, obviously during uh, London Climate Action Week. Um, I expect that uh, many of you don't know much about the Crown Estate, so I'm going to start by introducing you to, to who we are. So we actively manage our diverse range of property around England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And of particular relevance to today is our management of the seabed and also half the foreshore in England and Wales. We're established by an Act of Parliament and we are charged with generating profit for the Treasury for the benefit of the nation. And um, we've got a clear purpose and that's um, delivering our purpose means that we'll create meaningful and lasting value, financial value, yes, but also environmental and social value, both for today and for future generations. So that's sort of an overview of the Crown Estate. So in the marine environment, our activities include spatial planning, and leasing of the seabed to enable energy, trade, building materials, um, and importantly, protecting biodiversity as well. That's at the core of what we do. And we work very closely with partners to enable this, um, this development of the seabed. For example, by funding research, convening expert groups, we invest in data collection. And what we don't do is we don't set government policy and we don't, we don't do statutory plans, that's for others. We work within that framework to deliver the spatial planning um, and, uh, and the leasing of the seabed and all of that information that goes around it. Um, but the, uh, the seabed is already uh, a very busy Place. I think I might have failed on the Petra Kucha already, actually, because I'm, I think I'm already a few seconds behind, so I'm just going to do some filling now while that slide catches up, because otherwise what I'm about to say isn't going to make sense. Uh, so uh, hopefully, good job you haven't got buzzers. Right. Oh, okay. I think there's a slide that went missing there. So the seabed already is a very busy place. Um, it's our power station. It feeds us. It provides aggregates. It supports our well-being, and we work and play on, under, and over it. Um, so it can actually be considered as um, a platform that enables the technologies that remove um, CO2 from the environment. So it can be an accumulator, it can be, um, it can be uh, a re direct removal of CO2, it can also prevent release of CO2, and through net zero technologies, then we can avoid release of CO2. Uh, these slides you can see now, carbon capture and storage, which is an important transition technology um, that stores the, sea the um, carbon dioxide permanently under the seabed and prevents from release into the atmosphere. So the UK continental shelf has great potential for storing carbon dioxide and it permanently prevents it from uh, re removing uh, back into the atmosphere. So what we do... Sorry, my slides are actually not right. I'm just going to keep on going. What I say is not going to match the slides. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's jumping two slides at a time. So this is carbon sequestra sequestration. So what we do is actually we plan the seabed um, to lease the technologies such as CCUS and all of those other traditional sectors that, um, that need to be carrying on, as well as the new technologies. So um, that includes things like natural habitats. So seagrass, mud, salt marsh, they alone capture more carbon dioxide than the UK's woodlands. So that's a really important point. And offshore coastal habitats also have a key role in carbon sequestration. So carbon sequestration is a key part of the developing blue economy. And we, as Crown Estate, we're working with innovators through the provision of seabed for test sites and to identify key resource areas so we can safeguard them in this context of a really busy competing demand for seabed space. And we're also developing our strategy for how we can actively uh, restore and enhance these areas and also look at new revenue streams from, uh, from habitats, for natural capital, for example. Um, 
So managing the seabed itself, how we manage the seabed, also has the, impact, the, the opportunity to impact on carbon dioxide because there is carbon dioxide, as you, as you heard from ITER, stored in sediments. And how we manage the removal of kelp, for example, or activities that disturb the seabed, that can result in the release of, um, of carbon dioxide. So it's important. Some of, that, some of that carbon dioxide could have been stored for thousands of years. We mustn't forget that angle when we're looking at how to actually remove the, um, the stuff in the atmosphere today. One of the, so this is going to be, <laughs> I'm going to talk about wind now, but the slides are not going to talk about wind. One of the major success stories for the UK is offshore wind. So over the past 20 years, we have um, built out uh, a really significant amount of gigawatts, and that's resulted in the removal or the avoided release of um, carbon dioxide from other industries. So we've got a current pipeline of around 80 gigawatts of offshore wind. So the potential to increase that avoided release is also really important. So in that whole sort of systems approach, then we need to take account of that as well. So just picking up on a point that ITER made, the seabed is a system, the ocean is a system. So any intervention that we make in one part of the system can have a, defect, a direct effect or an indirect effect on other parts of the system. So it's really important that we understand what we're doing. So we just reinforce that point made by ITER and we should be testing before we actually move things, noting still that we have very um, big targets and not much time to actually achieve that. Um, so innovation is at the heart of um, achieving net zero. So uh, understanding how projects actually innovate beyond status quo is something that we really need to do. So that could be technological innovation, but it also could be regulatory or policy innovation. We need to think of that whole spectrum of what a project brings to the system. And our approach to management is much more than simply leasing seabed. So we invest in research and we support pilot projects. Um, such as habitat restoration and natural capital. And we're really keen to build relationships with those working in this area as we all move towards achieving the net zero targets. You might have seen an image of our, ma our marine data exchange a couple of slides ago. Um, and this is our free to access online database, which has more than 2,300 um, data uh, sources in it from um, offshore wind farms, through marine aggregates, through wave and tidal, feasibility studies through to decommissioning. So really invaluable source of information for anybody who's involved in managing or wants to um, develop the seabed. So important as we look at these, no, these new technologies. Um, I'd like to finish by highlighting the importance of biodiversity. And we've placed biodiversity at the heart of our activities, and it's also enshrined in our net zero roadmap. So it's really important as we develop these new technologies buzzers should be going now, that we, um, that we remember biodiversity in its own right and we develop new ways to restore the environment across the, um, across the seabed. Um, this is a fantastic opportunity for us to come together, private sector, public sector, developers, NGOs, academics, all of us sharing skills, sharing our experience to build upon the platform that the seabed provides um, and to innovate our way to achieving net zero. Thank you. She did very well there, didn't she? <laughs> One more round of applause for Nicola. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> we should make this a game at Christmas, you know, just get the slides out. Um, but yeah, so now for 20 more slides um, from an another amazing speaker, over to the founder and executive director of the Climate Foundation. He recently won the Elon Musk X Prize. Um, I'll let him tell you more about it. And I believe there's a colleague in the room. Is there a Sam in the room? Can I have a whoop from Sam? There we go. Um, but yeah, all the way from down under, it's Dr. Brian von Herzen. Round of applause. <laughs> Greetings, I'm Brian von Herzen from the Climate Foundation, where we are working on food security for billions of people who depend on the oceans for their sustenance, to uh, ecosystems who depend on not only having enough food for humanity, but enough food for nature in the oceans and enough fish habitat in the oceans and finally, measuring the carbon balance and carbon export of these regenerative interventions. Ocean stratification is a huge problem today, and it's resulted in 20% less production in the uh, tropics and 5% um, less production in the subtropics, and it results in less kelp forestry. From California to Tasmania, we've seen 95% losses of kelp forests, tropical seaweed forests, and even coral reefs. It's a harbinger of the losses that we can expect in the future uh, to be profoundly affecting the ocean and its productivity going forward. 
Before global warming, wind shear would provide plenty of upwelling and plenty of deep nutrients. Now ocean warming is disrupting the natural processes with the water being too warm and the nutrient levels being too deep. Um, and the result with marine permaculture is we use wave, wind, and solar energy to restore natural upwelling and enable those kelp forests to thrive once again. We've investigated marine permaculture through the first technology Renaissance levels. We've demonstrated that commercial seaweeds grow great um, and superior uh, with deep water irrigation. And now we're going from 100 square meters to 1,000 square meters. And in the next 12 months, we'll start on an economically sustainable hectare. We've already demonstrated growth rates of 100 to 300% per month compared to controls that were actually shrinking in size because the nutrient levels were too low. This represents a huge opportunity to rescue production for seaweed communities around uh, Philippines and Indonesia, extending across Asia uh, and tropically throughout the world. Now these tropics experience category five hurricanes, but by lowering our seaweed platform five meters below the surface, we can escape those and survive intact. The platforms actually survive with the seaweed on them. And we provided a quarter ton of seaweed to neighboring communities to reseed their farms. The deep water irrigation technique is resilient to these storms. It's also resilient to warm water temperatures and low nutrient levels that can um, effectively, by providing deep water irrigation, we can rescue production and boost productivity and enable cultivation offshore. That cultivation produces food, feed, and fertilizer markets as the first three of a dozen value chains that are gonna transform humanity's relationship with the ocean to regeneration and enable us to rely upon the ocean increasingly for offshore seaweed cultivation, providing uh, food, feed, and fertilizer products that can restore our agricultural production as well. Now in agriculture, our first product is a seaweed foliar biostimulant that can, in the um, worst case of high nitrate fertilizer, nitrate fertilizer can reduce those fertilizer requirements by 20% and it can actually enable the 20% um, less um, uh, emissions and 20% less nitrous oxide production and still maintain yields. The seaweed fixation of uh, a kelp forest is uh, higher than any other ecosystem. In fact, 15% higher carbon uh, per square meter per year than the kelp forest than even the tropical rainforest. As a result, it's a huge opportunity to uh, transform those kelp forests into carbon sinks. Those carbon sinks are the big blue square of the ocean and um, taking a small amount of carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it into the middle and deep ocean, small in the sense that it's uh, just uh, one third of the black box represents a key opportunity. And when seaweed falls off the platform during growth and sinks a thousand, square, a thousand meters per day, it remains uh, in the abyssal ocean for centuries. And that represents a great opportunity to sequester carbon and enable the seaweed and measure the seaweed that sinks to depth. We measure that using some of the um, flux measurements. We've got a catcher's mitt that catches seaweed every square meter of seaweed. You know, it can measure the seaweed that's falling through that square meter per day, uh, get a weight measurement, and that measures directly the flux of carbon out of the atmosphere. We also can measure the oxygen levels and use other instruments to measure this as well. And um, several references have effectively found the time uh, before next contact with the atmosphere, the number of hundreds of years, and if you get down a thousand meters, it's many hundreds of years till uh, the, that ocean returns to the surface, and that's um, in the Pacific Ocean in particular. Our vision is to cultivate seaweed for commercial use and enable not only the growth of seaweed, but also ecosystem services, commercial use in food, feed, and fertilizer, and the residual plat uh, seaweed that falls off the platform during growth sinks to the seafloor and can be uh, sequestered for centuries. Now there's 8,000 tons per square kilometer per year estimated sinking directly. 12,000 tons is saved by not having to produce nitrate fertilizer for those agricultural crops receiving the seaweeds um, biostimulants. And around 10,000 tons are avoided because there's 20% less nitrous oxide emissions uh, as a result of the lower application of fertilizer. Now, our challenges are to raise capital, scale exponentially, and to uh, validate these uh, seaweed blue carbon methodologies over time, step by step. I think we've got a great opportunity to grow to hundreds of hectares 
and really enable this to thrive and to scale. We're really grateful to our partners, including the XPRIZE for Carbon Removal, who are, um, provided us with the milestone prize of a million dollars. Uh, that builds a, provides us with a second million of three million that we'll need in order to demonstrate the first commercially sustainable hectare. Many of our other partners have uh, documented these results, um, including The Economist and Speed and Scale by John Doerr. And with that, I will thank you for your interest in marine permaculture at the Climate Foundation. Feel free to get in touch with us at climatefoundation.org. We managed to address most of the SDGs, and we're looking forward to scaling from the um, great recognition we got from the X Prize, and uh, look forward to your uh, following comments and discussion. Thank you again to Dr. Brian and his very cool Zoom background, big fan. Um, now for the final speaker of today's session. Uh, she's from Captura. They're an organization that are developing cost competitive CO2 capture and sequestration technology for extracting CO2 from ocean water. I can breathe now. Um, it's their business development officer, Maya Kashapov. Big round of applause, please. Maya Kashapov and I just joined the business development team at Captura. I'm thrilled to tell you about it. As a young person with my whole life ahead of me, climate change seems to be around every single corner I turn. I felt like I had no choice but to pursue a career in climate if I wanted to do my part in securing an inhabitable future for myself and my future family. The more I learned about carbon removal, the more clear it became that our world does not have to end up this way. We have solutions available, we just need to raise awareness so we can start implementing them fast. The IPCC tells us that reducing our emissions is no longer sufficient, so keeping warming at sustainable levels means complementing emissions cuts with mass carbon removal. Importantly, we can't delay carbon removal. In many cases, it can be a much more effective way of decarbonizing many of our costly or hard to abate emissions today. This curve shows the cost of stopping every emission at source. It's many trillions of dollars. If we can permanently remove emissions at a lower cost than stopping them, why wouldn't we use carbon removal to offset those emissions now? After all, we're trying to get to net zero and one plus minus one also equals zero. So how do we reduce this cost? Carbon removal is difficult. Atmospheric CO2 is just 420 parts per million. So to capture a ton of CO2 means moving a lot of air. The leading direct air capture companies build machines to move large quantities of air and use absorbents that must be replaced or regenerated. Those are great solutions and will undoubtedly play a major role in carbon removal. Captura addresses the cost challenge by using the world's largest existing and zero cost CO2 air contactor and absorber, the ocean. Drawing down a third of all emissions we release today and being one of the biggest carbon sinks on Earth, the ocean covers 70% of the surface of the planet and it has massive potential to help us remove enormous amounts of planet warming CO2. But we must ensure that we use the ocean in a safe way. Ocean acidification from CO2 absorption threatens marine life, so it's not a good idea to store more CO2 in the ocean. We must use the ocean to capture atmospheric CO2 without increasing the level of CO2 that's already there. So how do we do that? Captura's process uses only ocean water and renewable electricity to remove a measurable stream of CO2. We then return that decarbonized water back into the ocean and it absorbs the same quantity of CO2 back out of the air. The CO2 stream we produce can then be permanently sequestered or utilized in products. The Captura process pulls a continuous stream of ocean water into our plant. Our proprietary electrodiasis technology dissociates the salt and water into an acid and a base. The acid goes into this stream of water, forcing the CO2 to bubble out. Once we've captured the CO2, we re-add the alkali to restore the ocean water, then return it to the ocean. So where can we do this? We take advantage of existing ocean infra infrastructure, such as desalination plants. These facilities generate salt water so we can add our system to produce a secondary benefit of carbon removal. As the energy transition takes effect, we can also install our technology on redundant offshore platforms currently used for oil and gas. Removing CO2 from the ocean has another benefit. Volumetrically, CO2 in the ocean is 150 times more concentrated than in the air, making it a much more efficient process. So where will we get this energy? The ocean has considerable and unused capacity to generate renewable electricity from the wind to the sun to the waves. 
So by using the ocean as an air contactor and absorber, using less energy and existing infrastructure where possible, we've been able to bring down the cost of carbon removal substantially. Captura has done a lot of work in assessing costs, and we're confident that we will be able to offer carbon removal at less than $100 a ton as our technology deploys. What a bargain. While low cost is important, so is scalability. We believe Captura can scale up to remove vast quantities of CO2 for a few reasons. Firstly, the ocean is enormous and readily available. Secondly, we utilize existing infrastructure. And finally, in the future, we can build dedicated Captura platforms like the one shown here. So where is our technology today? Overall, we believe we're at technology readiness level five or six. Captura's technology developed, was developed at Caltech in California, where we have an end-to-end -end demonstration. The key technology enabler for the Captura system is the efficiency of the bipolar membranes within the electrodialysis unit, but I can't give away any more secrets than that, sorry. Next, our team will deploy a pilot system by the ocean. Our pilot will capture about one ton of CO2 per year. More importantly, it's fully equipped with sensors and instru instruments so we can monitor the performance of every aspect of the system, enabling us to continuously improve the technology. As soon as we finish the one-ton system, we'll start work on the next pilot, which will have 100 times the capacity. The one-ton system is heading to the California coast, where we will use Caltech's marine laboratory to operate the system with a stream of ocean water. We'll install our equipment onto the rafts you can see in this photo, the power, then power the system using solar panels and launch our Captura boat into the Pacific Ocean. This past Earth Day, we were thrilled to be an awarded an X Prize Milestone Award. Captura was selected as one of 15 teams from a pool of well over 1,000 applicants. With an extremely demanding screening and selection process, this award was an awesome recognition of the potential of our technology. Of course, there's still so much work left to do. We're currently working to establish sources of renewable energy to power our systems, collaborate with oceanographers to ensure protection of marine life, raise additional funding to power continued innovation and deployment, and determine the lifetime and performance of our equipment operating in ocean water. But we can't do this alone. We need partners to help build out our plants, investors to help fund deployment and continued R&D, customers to purchase carbon credits or utilize our CO2, and suppliers to provide the equipment we need to scale rapidly. As a young startup, we need all the help that we can get. If you're interested in working with us, we'd love to hear from you. When I graduated from the Columbia Climate School in New York as part of its inaugural cohort just last month, I was determined to immediately get to work in addressing the climate crisis. I'm thrilled to be joining Captura just a few weeks later and making a tangible contribution in the fight against climate change. Join us in making our carbon removal vision a reality. How great is Maya? You'd be so thrilled if your kids turned out like that, wouldn't you? <laughs> um, right, now I'd like to welcome back my other lovely speakers to the stage and to the screen. If you'd like to take a seat with me. This really is like Britain's Got Talent now. No, no slides, the end of the slides. Um, well, firstly, does, if anyone's got any questions, would you like to put your hand up and we can run a mic to you? Any questions in the audience at all or online, if there are any that want to be fed to us? Yeah, would we be able to get a mic down here? Just any more, I'm going to try and take them uh, at once. If there's any more questions, just stick your hand up, and if not, we'll just stick with this one. Uh, hello, I'm uh, wondering how you're interacting with the fishing industry. Is that to me? Or well, in general, to all the speakers. But would, um, yeah. who? Yeah, off you go. Yeah, so um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, in, um, so the fishing industry is one of the really big stakeholders in, in everything that the Crown Estate does. So um, we have ongoing relationships with them all around the coast of England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, making sure we understand where are the intensive fishing areas um, from the activity perspective and also where are the important areas from fish themselves, so the um, nursery owners areas and spawning areas. So what we aim to do um, when we are looking at leasing, for example, for any of te the technologies that we might be talking about today is develop the choice of sites with all of those stakeholders. So the fishing industry are not, are not having something done to them. They have the opportunity to be involved in that process. There's always going to be a balance um, for the outcome, but it's absolutely a key part of, um, of the process of uh, site selection. Go to the others. Yeah, of course. Um, Dr. Brian, would you like an input? 
Yes, um, around our pilot scale platform in the Philippines today, we have not only um, a thousands of sardines, but also hundreds of tuna have been living around the platform. We've had dozens of dolphins spending more than a month there. So I'm about 200 kilometers and spent three days with us on the platform. So nature has voted with her fins and said, we've got the great stuff <laughs> there. And um, the, the sardine fishermen have actually come around and, and uh, fish around the platform day and night. This is an a great example of not only how marine permaculture attracts fish, but we have evidence that it's regenerative, that it's actually growing more fish. So we see that as a really synergistic play with the fisheries, and it's a way to regenerate the uh, sardines and anchovies of the ocean. I like that, voting with the fins. Nice touch. Um, Ita, did you? Yeah, no, I think, I think obviously not doing a project, but I think that the, the critical thing about the, especially the, the natural climate solution options that are on the table is, is, as has just been illustrated, where they can be symbiotic, where they can really help multiple. Uh, so they're helping uh, on the carbon dioxide removal front, but they're also helping biodiversity uh, regeneration and if you get the project design right and if you get the, the how you set up the structures right, also help local ocean communities benefit uh, from uh, the resources that, 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 are, that they are close to and that they are stewards of and manage. So I think where, when you get the, especially the natural climate solutions um, right and indeed some of the hybrid solutions as well, uh, it can be a, a real boon for both the fishing industry and a natural climate solutions as well. Did that answer your question? There any more? Um, just going to check. There's no questions <coughs> online, or oh, uh, I can ask you guys a question. Fantastic. Aita, you mentioned that there needs to be a bit of safety and precaution in these solutions that we're developing to like put carbon back into the ocean. But we're really competing against a very tight timeline here. Yeah. So is there like a level of risk that we need to be willing to take? when we've already, we've already pumped the world full of carbon and carbon dioxide. We, and we did that without understanding the risk, or perhaps we did understand the risk and nobody told us. Um, so how much, how much risk do we need to take um, towards this particular um, step in, clim in climate change? So I think it's, it's a really, really good point. I think, but the crucial thing is this, there is a portfolio of solutions available. And the way we can manage the risk is to try and deploy across that range. So oceans give us a suite of solutions. Uh, there was also the land-based solutions that um, uh, have been talked about as well. Um, and we also have a whole load of solutions that are in the emissions reduction space as well. So actually, I, I think while on the one hand, um, it is in, you know, there is an option to say, oh, if we can do lots of removals cheaply, um, well, that's great. But we can't do them cheaply now and we can't do them at scale now. So what we need to do is have a portfolio approach your, where we're asking industry and we're asking countries to decarbonize their emissions and reduce those emissions. And there's a ton of things moving there, in, in including in the harder to abate sectors, in steel, in cement, in uh, aviation. There are real uh, emissions reduction opportunities that we can uh, deploy. Also developing those carbon dioxide removals, but not skipping the uh, the precautionary and science-based approach to make sure we understand that we're not going to make it worse. And that's the, big, that's the big risk, that if we just blindly go in too fast and we don't take the time to let the scientists understand what's happening. Um, but crucially, we can speed this up. So massive funding for those research and development efforts today, now, to make sure all of these solutions that are being developed have the research in behind them and then can scale very rapidly when we're comfortable, we know what they're going to do. That's really the solution to, to square the circle. I think we've probably got time for one more quick question. You can select. Yep. Hi, uh, I have a question for the innovators. On the point of funding, I was just interested whether you had approached the investment industry, whether you had started fundraising and what the reaction has been from them. Dr. Brian, would you like to? Uh... Yes, well, we're really grateful to have the recognition of the X Prize for carbon removal and uh, have the opportunity to really showcase that. And we see this as an opportunity to really raise an order of magnitude more funds that will enable us to grow uh, 15 hectares or more of marine permaculture. And that's enough to bring down uh, and, and sink 
more than 1,000 tons of carbon dioxide over the performance period of February 2024 to February 2025. That's for the uh, X Prize, the grand prize for carbon removal. And that's a, a great uh, booster, let's say, towards building a really healthy and sustainable marine permaculture industry that can apply from the Mediterranean to the Pacific and Indian Oceans. So we see a huge opportunity there to scale uh, the Milestone X Prize and really enable this to work well. And I think an integrated and blended approach from philanthropy to uh, blended in finance and investment can enable um, significant scaling, which is going to be necessary in order for us to, per uh, to uh, avoid a recapitulation of the Permian mass extinction in which 96% of all marine species perished. Great. Um, and I think it's, oh, should we go over? Yeah, we can go over to this side if we have time. Hello, Maya. Would you like to input? Hi, yes, thank you for having me. Um, yes, we are also very uh, pleased and excited to share that we were also awarded uh, the XPRIZE Milestone Award, which is a fantastic recognition of the potential of our technology. Um, I think we have definitely seen additional excitement on the investor side. Um, a lot of the interested groups that we've been talking to um, point to a lot of the ways that we're able to overcome um, the barriers of a lot of other carbon removal technology innovations. Um, um, so we are able to overcome some of the scaling and uh, the cost issues since we're using an existing air contact or an absorber or the ocean uh, also happens to be free, which is nice. Um, so I think we have a lot of potential to, to really overcome some of those problems. And in terms of scaling, we have a really uh, unique licensing model that allows us to continue to focus on R&D and innovation um, of our technology while our partners um, in parallel deploy our technology and focus on the actual carbon and removal. So every aspect of our business is focused on um, overcoming all of those barriers in carbon removal and therefore we've, we've seen a lot of really amazing interest on the investor community side. Thanks Maya um, and I think we don't have time for any more questions but a lot of the contact details are on the screen if you want any more information anyone from the conduit will be happy to help you. Um, but Ita do you have any inspiring words to close or reflections? Just to put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think what's really exciting is hearing about these projects, the fact they're being developed today, the fact you are having these conversations today. Um, we know we don't have a lot of time, but we can still deploy these solutions, and we should, and we must. And so it's really it's inspirational to be with people who are doing that today. Oh, well, I just want to say a big round of applause one more time for all our speakers and innovators. I thought that was really inspiring. Um, just thank you again to The Conduit, Systemic, The Crown Estate and Salesforce for making this all possible and a few bits for you to look forward to. Um, from 1.30 upstairs in the bookshop, there'll be a solution circle that's presented in collaboration with The Crown Estate, focusing on ocean stewardship. Um, spaces are limited for this, so grab a member of The Conduit team if you want to register if you haven't already. Um, and if you like today's session, we'll be back again tomorrow at 3.30 for our next solution stage with a focus on agroforestry. And um, I'll be back tomorrow as well hosting, oh, today. So sorry, today. Um, and yeah, tomorrow I'll be back hosting Proteins of the Future. Um, so yeah, thank you so much again for joining us. I hope that was really inspiring and informative. And a big round of applause for everyone again. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next session is going to start here at one o'clock. It's going to be the conversation with George Monbiot. So um, you've got about just over 10 minutes before we start again.